yeah, another British developer. They worked on Crackdown 2, Connect Playfit, and Fragmental. But they did collaborative. That's embarrassing. <laughs> I would never admit that. Do you, what games have you made? Well, we made three. Well, what are they? Uh, we with this one for PlayStation, and we made another one for computer. What's the third one? We made two. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 87 of the Thought Patrol podcast. We are back here to talk to you about potentially non-interesting things. And boy, am I excited. So this was... No, man, we planned it non-interesting. What are you talking about? This took work. Exactly. <laughs> I went on uh, my research sites, a.k.a. Uh, any... Like IGN, GameSpot, stuff like that. I'm like, let's find out the least popular articles from the week, and we're going to talk about them. So, uh, <clears throat> actually, nothing really has happened this week. Nothing major, but uh, we still have some some news to cover. So we're going to talk about that when we get there. It's just me and Sean this week. Caitlin has abandoned Surprise! us. Yeah, I know. What else is new? But uh, we, I had asked. I like sent out a call. I'm like, boys. We got a third spot available. I know it's coveted. Everyone's clawing for it, but we got a third spot available and we need the hosts to step up in this time of need to, to add that additional layer of conversation to our podcast. And what do you know? <laughs> like Tyler was the only one that responded and he said he couldn't. And the other like four people in that discord or that group chat are like, nope. Or well, they didn't. I, they just left us on read if they even read it. Tbh. So that is that is uh how we are where we are today. But hey, me and Sean are here. I know you love listening to our voices and us uh, complain about different things on the internet. But who doesn't? Uh, so we're gonna go ahead. Who doesn't? I'm gonna do intros real quick. Real quick. Real quick. Because again, we're trying to kind of cut time here and there. Make this uh, what I'm doing right now is the complete opposite of what we're trying to do, which is uh, segmenting and monologuing and all that shit. But Sean, how have you been, bro? Have you played anything interesting this week that you'd like to share, or has anything interesting happened to you that you'd like to share? A little bit more Do Double May Cry, and uh, I love that game just as much as I did the first run out. A little bit of Dead or Alive, but I didn't want to get into that because I still have to go back and complete Soul Calibur, and there's an asshole to unlock in Soul Calibur. So. Ouch. But I'm just glad because Dead or Alive is one of the best 3D fighters that I've ever played next to Soul Calibur. I mean, I, Soul Calibur still keeps the 3D, which I'm glad about. Um, and Dead or Alive was just one of the best fighting engines. I always liked it because there wasn't really a lot of your jumps aren't super high. You don't have any supernatural moves. It's, it's all inspired by real martial arts. Kind of like Virtual Fighters uh, moves were like pulling barbs out of your anus. Like, okay. It's just a very difficult game to master. Like gotcha. Virtual Fighter 4, the second edition of Virtual Fighter 4 was really, really good, but it's really difficult to pull off the moves. Whereas... Um, Dead or Alive, all the moves were a lot more intuitive, and it's very intuitive to chain one attack to another attack, so you can create your own combinations of attacks that work for you and how you like to play. Yes, there's the Elasto booby stuff going on. Oh, um, bro, it's it my doesn't favorite seem part. prevalent in this one. No, they, they seem to have toned it down some. Yeah, they said. I remember us reading an actual article talking about that that they were going to be toning down the booby physics for six and also making some changes to the game's fighting engine to make it a little bit more uh, new user friendly, I think was the words that they used. That I don't, <clears throat> I haven't, I haven't got to do much with it. Um, honestly, part of its charm was its classlessness. Like you could play it as a normal fighter or you could just turn on the goof tardedness with the, with the giant, you know, weird stretchy jumblies and yeah, bro, beach volleyball. I don't think you should remove that. I really don't. Like, I don't think they should have taken that out. But at the heart of Dead or Alive, the reason why I've loved it is the characters are interesting, the storyline has its interesting parts, and the fighting engine was always rock solid. Uh, the plot. I, don't, I always thought that it was easy to pick in. There actually is a plot. The first one 
didn't have much of one, yeah, but, but I, I mean, um, the, I mean, they the, really don't tell you much. There's I not mean, the like plot, any dialogue, really. The plot, so Sean. Talking. The plot. Yeah. As I as I cup my invisible tits. Yeah, the nipples on the plots. Yeah, yeah dude. Um, but the the characters were good. At it. Plus, it has Ninja Gaiden in it. It has Ruhayabusa and Ayane, and a couple other cameos here and there. So I've always been a fan of the series. I didn't like all the flack it got just because there was sexualization, but we've had that discussion like a bajillion times. So. Um, outside of that, I've pushed the story for it a lot in Final Fantasy XIV, and I watched, I don't know if I mentioned, I think, yeah, I watched Roka and the Six Braves, and I finished it, and I, it's, it definitely was not what I expected it to be. I was pleasantly surprised. The studio that did it, Passion, is not known for having follow-ups to their they're kind of like Dio Medea, only for some reason Dio Medea gets more business. And Passion does really good animation. Mm-hmm. Like their animations, they're really, really good. Their CGs, eh. It's kind of in between. I mean, Let's it's be better fair. than Goblin Slayer, but not by a lot. <laughs> Most CG is eh, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but not really. that's, that's, that's also true. It's passable. You know, it, I wish they hadn't used it, but they used it sparingly, so I'm okay with that. Um, but, but the animation was good. And we're with Diamondia, the animation's usually average to okay. This was actually good. The plot was good. If you, I don't, without spoiling it, if you really, really like twists, and I'm talking about well done ones like Shyamalan before he went poo poo, um, this is good because it starts off like an epic um, quest to save the world, fight the demon lord, little hints of other epic quests shows in there you know you've got the different chosen heroes that have to band together and find each other to stop doomsday or whatnot and then right after they explain that much to you it shifts into an entirely different genre dope and and then you're just glued to it from episode to episode and i spam the thing i watched one episode and then i watched the entire rest of the series split between two nights after work and i loved it uh, and I'm still looking for a job in Central Florida that is not uh, slavery <laughs> Shit. Yeah. Uh, and anal rapage combined. So if Whoa. anybody uh, would like to help, um, I'm willing to submit my resume to the overlords. Yeah, bro. Would you like? Oh, dude, would you like to employ a thick, lovely gentleman? Uh, please let lovely. us know. Yeah. Did you say uh, what? Huh? Did you say bubbly? I said lovely. No, listen. Lovely. No, I was agreeing with your lovely. I was oh, okay. I thought you said bubbly. <laughs> I'm like, hey, I'm, I won't, I won't say. Bubbly is definitely a, definitely a word I would not associate with myself. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, I'm glad you're doing okay. I've, I'm like on episode four of Roka, and I enjoy the characters that I could say. Story I haven't gotten too deep into, but I definitely like the characters. I think the character design is nice. They're all unique in their own way, um, and it's pretty cool so far. So I'm interested to get back to it. Uh, I'm just behind... Because I've been told to watch it, like, this is the second time I've been told to watch it, one from Ansi and one from you, so I just gotta get through it. <clears throat> I watch it at work, usually, so it, de- so it depends on the, what's going on at work, uh, and how busy or not busy it is, but I'm glad that you're good. I had, I finished Devil May Cry the first playthrough, so I'm not done done, mm-hmm. but I've gone through the story, uh, it was very enjoyable, I liked it a lot, but, like, the ending was hella anime-esque which isn't necessarily bad but uh it, it was it was it was it was it was good i liked it i liked the characters obviously um the way that they because they kind of they've been pushing dante out of the series for a while obviously and you think this be kind of his last leg in the series, but i think the way they have it set up as it ends there's still opportunity for him to cameo in the future and appear but i know that they're fully like they're like trying to fully shift the focus to nero as the main it's character not, it's unfortunate because nero is just not as strong or as compelling a character no but uh i really think uh dante dante uh, it, at the very least they could flesh the crew out and involve stories that have a wider cast because previously you've only had a small handful of cast members including the villains you know you might have two or three major villains and you have dante and then lady and trish would sometimes show up to back him up or in two it was lucia or whatever the fuck her name is 
you know, uh, you didn't you didn't have it littered with with cast members. So it really spent a lot of time focusing on Dante with the occasional pop in of his supporting group. And you, they've expanded it by one character with Nero in the last game. And then this game, they added V and this and that mechanic chick. Yeah, Nico. Um, and I think that that just provides more storytelling opportunities. I don't think I don't know why the this the team has been so dead set on phasing out Dante. I, it, they've been just pushing that since four, and they accomplished their goal with fought with a DMC because DMC's character was essentially Nero. I mean, he he has a lot of behavioral traits in common with Nero: the attitude and the cockiness. It's similar to Dante, but different. Mm-hmm. And, and I just I uh, I fucking hate his hair. I yeah, a lot of it. There, <clears throat> normal hair. Um, like I, he had normal hair in four. Ne- like Nero had normal hair. Why did they make him a Backstreet Boy? I'm I'm okay with the the move forward. Um, I think that I like the uh, the interactions between Nico and Nero. I think they're cool. I like their truck. I think the the again the way they converse with each other it's a nice little what's the word i'm thinking of here it's a nice little i don't know Food here. be right back okay <laughs> every time i think of the word i'm trying to say I now think, it's my turn entertain them <clears throat> got you all right boys uh i'm gonna continue talking about devil may cry like i was before i was rudely interrupted by sandwich boy um <clears throat> I think that moving forward, I'm okay with the push to Nero. Um, again, I like Nico. I like Nero. I like their van. I like the way they talk to each other. Every time I think of the word I'm trying to use, I think dichotomy, and that is not it, but it's whatever. I've done that a million and a half times. Um, great game, by the way. Finished it. Uh, I would probably give it like a... I, I kind of agree with what most of everyone's saying about a nine, at eight or nine out of ten. The music's fantastic. Um, I feel, I wish the music played more often kind of thing. Uh, I know that would kind of, so since there's only a, like, everyone has their, their theme, I could get that being repetitive. It's just sometimes I'd be running, especially in the earlier, like, Kuila Taff or whatever that giant tree, um, in the early areas of those stages, you, you could just be running. And since you're not really necessarily engaging in combat, you don't really, like, it's not you're not really hearing much. It's really weird. Like there's no like predominant track going on. That's like, that stands out. And it felt like empty in a way. Cause when you do go into combat, you got like devil trigger playing or V song or Dante's screamo song playing and all this going on. And it, it just, it kicks in and then it's nice. But then like the moment you pop out of combat and you're out of that arena, you're back to like, ambiance it's, it's it was very weird it felt weird um <clears throat> so that i that was the only thing but for the most part i love the game it looks gorgeous in the re engine like i can't wait to see more games utilize the resident evil engine because it is so pretty and now we know not only can they make first person and third person shooters with re7 and re2 the remake now we know that they can make fighting games in there like hack and slash games which is awesome so i hope that this engine is very malleable um that they can do a lot with it and we could just see more and more things come out of this engine because it's just so damn pretty and i love looking at devil may cry i love looking at re2 those games are fucking gorgeous even re7 was super pretty so that was um Definitely really awesome. I really enjoyed Devil May Cry for what it was. I guess I could go on with the rest of my week. Um, move move forward from Devil May Cry. Played more Final Fantasy fourteen. What can I say? Really, I just can't get enough of that game. Recently passed like the 38 or 39 days played mark. So that's crazy. And even just before this podcast, I actually unlocked Mentorship, which is a program in the game where... Um, you get like a little crown next to your name and it basically symbolizes that you are ready to help newer players and people that aren't too sure of what's going on and also shows that you have a lot of experience with the game as a whole. You have to do, there's a lot of things. You have to get three classes or basically all three roles. So the DPS role, the healing role, and the tank role. You need one class from all three of those roles. You need to complete the level 60 quest for each of those classes. So basically you have to get them all to level 60 that's like step one. 
Uh, another step is getting 300 commendations from other players. So they liked your progress or what you did, and they're willing to th give you a thumbs up, basically, at the end of a dungeon, um, which I, I have so many of those. I'm like close to like seven or 800 at this point. Um, <clears throat> and then finally is 1,000 dungeons. And I was really close. I like recently passed 900. So we basically kind of... 1,500. 1,500 commendations? Commendation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I recently past like the 900 mark especially doing like the relic quest you do a lot of dungeons throughout the the building of the heaven's word relic um so i was like well i'm just gonna finish this so i sat down and basically spammed uh there's there's like easy trials and i wasn't aware that a trial counted i thought it had to be an instance dungeon so sean's like oh no dumbass you gotta fuck it you can do it with like easy e free which takes like four seconds if you're max level um so that's what I did. Sat there and just spammed that and did that like 90 times in like an hour and got to a thousand, went to apply for mentorship, and now I have a little crown next to my name, which is really cool. Um, they also give you access to the novice network and you can like chat with newer players and be willing to help. And it's just like a thing that you do and you, you just kind of promote like nice behavior in the community, be nice to people, be understanding with people kind of thing and kind of you're like that exemplary member of the community. And uh, they give you a little crown to, simp to show that by your name, which is really cool. So I'm excited to be that. I feel like it's worth it, uh, the grind that to get to that point. And uh, I'm excited to keep playing. Been doing more relics, doing all this shit, trying to get to max item level on my three mains, which is the Dark Knight, Astrologian, and Summoner. And then uh, once that happens, my next goal will probably be, because I recently pre-ordered the new expansion, and they dropped like this earring that you can get with it that gives a 30% experience boost to whatever character has it equipped. And it also scales with your item level, which is super cool. So you could put it on them at level 1 and keep it equipped all the way to 70 <clears throat> and um, not have any issue with it. So uh, maybe leveling some alts, because I have a bunch of characters that are like between the 50 and 70 mark. So I could just go on them and just push them all to 70. So when the expansion drops, the only thing I'd have to do is get them all to 80 and then go from there. So definitely excited, but I'd rather get my three main characters to close to max item level first and then um, do other things after that. Maybe go glamour hunting, finding cosmetics. There's just so much fucking shit to do. I still haven't even touched Eureka, and that's its, it's, a whole, its whole other ball game uh, that I have to delve into, so exciting to keep playing that that's about it uh but one other thing i've played recently which i enjoyed a shitload actually streamed it yesterday this will be the last thing we'll move forward <clears throat> um was so i picked up a game called cultist simulator not too long ago in a humble bundle didn't really know what it was recently i watched there's this youtube channel that i absolutely adore his name is mandalore gaming and he talks about um, kind of like older, not necessarily mainstream games. Hey, he does reviews on them. So stuff from like like obscure Warhammer titles to uh, RTS games that were, again, more obscure to just, just like interesting things that like I've never heard of. And other people might have. But like there's like one was like Limbo of the Lost, which is like one of those like so bad it's good kind of things. And just a bunch of interesting things, and he does like really comprehensive reviews. He's very funny, just an awesome YouTube channel. I recommend you checking him out if you like that the idea of like those obscure older game titles from like the late '90s to like uh, 2010s. Even even later than that, he's done some reviews outside of that area. So it's just cool seeing what he puts out, and he puts a lot of work into his videos. But he did one on Cult of Simulator, and um, I had no idea what it was. I saw cards on a table. So I was like, what the fuck is going on? And so we decided to play it last night on stream. And that was probably about the same, that was the same thing that came out of my mouth for most of the early part of that stream. Like, what the fuck is going on? Um, you're basically, <clears throat> it is a cultist simulator, but instead of doing it through like an open world and moving around and talking to people, it is all done through cards. So you're given like, there's timers that go off. Everything's running on a active at like an active time where you can still pause if you need to <clears throat> and you're constantly battling things like money starvation um your health your mental health and you're trying to create a cult and delve into like cthulhu-esque lore and stuff like that and it was just so it's just so engaging and engrossing trying to keep yourself alive and 
delve into these like darker arts and think figure out what's going on recruit people for your cult try to avoid the police from building evidence on you and try and throwing your ass in jail there's a bunch of different ways that the game can actually end and that you can you can fail but the way the game works is there's a legacy system so <clears throat> you start as an an aspirant or aspirant i don't know how you pronounce it but uh uh, you're basically nobody. You work a, de- a dead end job, and you get a group of funds from a gentleman that you knew that passed away recently, and then you play through. You you have a bunch of money. As time progresses, you lose money just over time, just like how real life happens. Expenses come up, shit like that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, um, if you die for whatever reason, um, and depending on how you die you unlock things called legacies. And so basically it's a roguelike in the sense that the story continues. It's, you don't necessarily restart. So I died and I was able to pick of three branches to branch the story. A little bit like roguelike. Yeah. Yeah. Branch, branch the story further out. So I could either have been the cop that, that was starting to compile the case against my cult or have been like a, I don't remember what the third one is. So the other one was like a physician that did the actual autopsy on my body. And um, <clears throat> so I decided to pick the physician. So then I start the game and I already have a job as a physician instead of a dead end job. Uh, my health is a little bit higher off the bat because I'm a physician. And then the story continues and I, you actually, actually perform the autopsy when the new round starts and you find all the occultic learnings that you had from your previous life. And then you basically pick up the mantle and continue um, the, that research and understanding and stuff like that. Super, super cool the way it works. Again, <clears throat> you're literally staring at pictures the whole time. And the way the gameplay loop is and the way the writing and story is done, it's incredibly engaging. Super fun game, really worth the time. I don't know if it's on console, but it is on PC. And you can get it for like a few bucks. I think it's it might be even less than 10. I got it on a humble bundle, but definitely worth your time especially if you're into kind of like the darker mythos kind of thing <clears throat> with like like um uh what's the, what's the name of that genre? Why is it escaping me? It's based on the artist <clears throat> that's kind of pioneered it. Can you help? darker mythos? Cthulhu. Artist. What is that genre called? Of literature. It was based on the author that pioneered it. Uh, I've, I've only heard macabre. Lovecraftian. And... Lovecraftian. That's the fucking word that's, I was. That's a descriptor, but it's not a genre. <clears throat> it, it it's it's but it's it's like a literature. It's a literary uh, whatever. It's there's a lot of books that kind of follow that, like like these these evil, not necessarily evil, but like gods that we have no understanding of and then learning about them makes things worse and it, that's the idea like Pulp fiction detective noir and then hidden horrors whatever it's lovecraftian and it's desire set in the 1920s everything about it screams uh lovecraftian it's really fucking fun and i i was addicted i was i played it to like four in the morning we were streaming it bruce are you retarded <laughs> I fucking hate this dog um but if that if any of that sounded interesting to you and you love like like car, like board games that, that involve cards and and reading through and kind of building your own story using those things um it's definitely worth your time i have a shitload of fun and i'm looking forward to going back to it so that's that that's that intros we need to move forward uh, but a lot kind of happened sure. that i was i liked i would love to share um if you want to check out more oh, of yeah. that there is a vod for that stream that is on the the Twitch, the Twitch, <laughs> Twitch.tv forward slash Thought Patrol. I mean, that's the first three hours of me playing and trying to figure out what the fuck was going on. So if you want to be invisible or see visible confusion while you yourself are in confusion, learning and to understand the game's mechanics together, I definitely recommend checking out that VOD and uh, just uh, <clears throat> looking through it. It's definitely an interesting title, and I love it to death so far. I really like it. But um, moving into our housekeeping, again, we have Twitch streams, twitch.tv forward slash Thought Patrol. If you want to converse with our community here, feel free to join our Discord. Uh, the links to all of this will be in the description below. If we talk about something that interests you this uh, this episode, feel free to leave a comment below wherever you're tuning into. Also, while you're doing that, feel free to subscribe so you can get uh, new content every week, Tuesday at 8 a.m. Santa. <laughs> Bruce, can you just not like sit on the bed? 
Why do I keep you in here? Because you know why? Because if I don't keep you in here, you sit in the hallway and you whine like a fuck for two hours. You know that, right? You prepubescent animal. Get on the bed. <laughs> I only hate them while we podcast, I promise. The rest of it, I, I, I'll, I give him french fries from McDonald's and stuff. That's how much I love him, even though I'm slowly killing him that way. But he loves it. And we're here for a, a good time, not a long time. Um, where was I? Twitter, at Thought Patrol PD. Facebook, um, Thought Patrol Podcast. Also, our sister page, The Streaming Geek. Check out reviews up there on anything streaming related. Um, finally, iTunes reviews. You want to help us out? Have a show up in like the algorithm and shit so we uh, get our name out there. Um, feel free to leave us a review. It'll help us out a lot, and we'd really appreciate it. <clears throat> With all that out of the way, we got a mailbag. This actually was like, like a fucking express delivery mailbag. Came in last second. Literally... 24 minutes ago this was dropped so after we had already started sam came in clutch i sent him a telepathic signal with my mind and he's like oh shit they don't have any mailbag questions time to get to work and that's what he did so he has a question for us sean and i appreciate it if you want to send us the question before we get into this you can do it a few ways either through our discord in the mailbag segment or the mailbag tab you could do it at our email thoughtpatrolcast at gmail.com through twitter with the uh, hashtag tp mailbag and also through um facebook through their facebook. face facebook messenger so any of those ways we will take it um just let us know that it's a mailbag you can either put like hashtag tp mailbag i don't know whatever just so that we know and then we can include it in the show and answer it on the show <clears throat> so sam asks hey quick question Really? <laughs> like, last second, I appreciate it. The next-gen consoles are on the horizon, and it's in a, an ex exciting time to be alive. So will you jump onto the hype train when the new hardware isn't announced, or wait until they've been put through the ringer? And will they have upgrade capabilities like a PC or stay locked into factory presets? You guys are great. Most of the time. Well, I see how it is. I see how it is. Sam. I see how it is. What do you think, Sean? What do you think, uh... Real quick, what the next console generation will look like. Hmm. I know we've talked about this a little bit before in the past. I will most definitely, unless there is a banger exclusive dropping when they launch, I will most definitely not be buying a new console. Um, until there is something that, that happens that is like, like, I absolutely have to have it, then I'll eventually take the plunge and pick it up. Um... I don't well, it think it depends on a lot of factors. To I, where I am financially. Oh yeah, that too. That's big. I but I heavily doubt they'll be modular. I'm a diehard console supporter. Okay. I, I, I heavily doubt they'll be modular in any way. Not this generation. It it I just don't feel like because the idea of console is the the ease of use kind of thing. It plug and play. You plug it in, it works, and it will work for the next few years until a new one comes out. That's one major selling point of the console is that you don't have to mess with things like modular upgrades or shit like that. So I, I can definitely still see kind of like our mid-generation drops, like where like a PS4 or a PS5 Pro kind of thing or an Xbox, I don't know what the fuck they'll call it, an Xbox X squared or some shit. I have no idea what they'll end up calling it. Um, uh, I could definitely see those still being a thing next generation, but I, I don't see like modular upgrades to consoles for a while. I, I really doubt it because if that was the case and people were willing to get a little bit extra power for paying more money, usually most of the time they just take the plunge and build a, like a, a mid tier PC. And then that's, that's what PC offers is that modular upgrade capability where console has more of the, the benefit of knowing that this will work for this many years and you don't have to do anything with it unless it breaks. It's just there and it exists and it's good to go. Whereas PC, you can have parts go out of, out of, uh, become like out of date and shit like that. Although a lot of games are optimized incredibly well to work on like, like a few generation prior systems and cards. So for the most part, um, depending on how willing you are to upgrade or not upgrade, you can use a card for a very long time. Our friend Tyler had a 960 up until like, like, like it was like a 960, 970 up until like last year. 
And I'm, I don't know exactly know how old that card is, but let's find out. It's last generation, that's for sure. Nine, let's see. NVIDIA 960 launch date. Let's see. Let's see what the GTX 960 launch date was. This car dropped in uh, 2015, early 2015. So he had it for three years, and that card is still a minimum requirement today. Like, a lot of games still can run with this card. So that's about the price of a console. And he was able to update, I think he has a 1080 right now, which is what I have. So it really depends on like the person doing it and how often they end up spending money on their computer. Some people always want the newest thing and the best thing out, so they'll drop the money as soon as something releases, and they uh, power to them if they have the financial uh, standing to do so. But um, I'd rather just let something run its course and then end up upgrading it in the future. But uh, again, I, I doubt that we'll see modular things coming to a console for a while. I think the the method that they have now, where it still is a new console, but it's just mid like development cycle for the next gen, they just drop like a a slight upgrade console. It, it worked well. People bought a shitload of PS4 Pros, even though I still think that that upgrade is not utilized to its best potential. Because there are still games coming out now that don't have like performance modes or anything like that that actually utilize the additional power there. Um, a lot of the time, the focus, again, is to the, the graphical standard. So these, these new systems will run 4K at 30 FPS, but I don't get a performance mode where I could prefer a higher frame rate to a lower resolution kind of thing. Not, not every game is taking advantage of this. If we see consoles next generation do that, wonderful. I'd love to be able to play all my games at 60 FPS instead of 30 and then a higher resolution. I would love that. And that would actually make me a lot more comfortable with buying a new console if I saw that that was something they would adapt. But as far as I've seen in the further push that they've been doing, it's always been higher resolution, higher graphical standing, and then frame rate has been a secondary for consoles. And if they change that motto, I'd, I'd love to jump right into the hype train as soon as it drops. If they announce like, oh yeah, this thing can do 4K, 60 FPS, any game, blah, 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 I'd, I'd be all about it. I'd, I'd be much more willing to put the put the price down if that was the case. But we'll have to see what happens when they do drop. Oh my gosh, my nose is stuffed. Um, I just want <clears throat> access to my library. Oh I want yeah. access to the games I've purchased. I want to be able to play those games. I don't want to be charged to be able to play in my PlayStation, PlayStation 2, PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4 games that I own. I mean, they want to make money off of that shit. And I already own it. I already paid for it. I'm pretty sure they... And they could put it... They they have a system on a chip. When they had the PS2, it didn't emulate the PS1. They, I mean, well, in a sense it did, but they took the PS1 architecture and chipped it. They were far enough in the future where they could put all the coding and shit of a PS1 onto a chip, and they had a small chip set on the PS2 board, so you essentially had both a PS1 and a PS2, and it could up-res with a certain degree the uh, the PlayStation 1 games, and it could load them a bit faster because the drive was faster. And PS3 came out, and it could do all of that, and they cut the shit out of it, and that was software emulation because it cost too much to have the hardware on there to allow them to do it. So they cut that out. They cut the data ports. All this next generation forward thinking shit got scalped because people weren't willing to pay for more. And that is, I think, what ultimately causes console industry to suffer, which makes the PC industry suffer because the lowest common denominator factor when they program games. But I will always be a supporter of consoles. It's not that I don't want to be able to play things on PC. It's just I like I there's a certain aesthetic that goes along with it, and that's a preference that no one has to justify. Yeah, but I, I think rather, I, w- I wouldn't be. A... So people are would Go be ahead. some people rather sit, like sit on a couch. You just like get home from work. You grab a controller. You press a button, and then you're you have access to all your games, and you're just there on the couch mm-hmm. chilling. You got a semi big TV or whatever, or a post stamp from from you know whatever, and um, yeah. They, you just sit and again plug and play, and the, and I I completely understand that mentality plug and play. Like, um, 
Although PC has gotten a lot better with you just being able to sit down, start a game, and it's fine. You don't really have any issues with it, especially with NVIDIA doing, as NVIDIA drops, like, optimization patches for things and stuff. Like, I've had so many games where I just plug, I just, I can download it, it's downloaded, I start it up, and I don't have to touch settings at all. Because it auto-reads my, my software, my hardware, and it immediately adjusts the settings that would hold a stable frame rate in in multiple environments now i do have a stronger card so it would i can't re speak for people that have weaker cards obviously you'd have to do a bit more management there because you're dealing with older hardware but for consoles i would love to see them take the approach that the wii u took with its older stuff and what the switch is doing now well not with having to pay for it but like emulation just to have everything software side and um you just have access to your games now i don't know how they would thing with that is I don't know how they would guarantee that you actually own something if you've purchased a disc a five years ago. Reader and it's that, that recognizes the disc isn't proper for the system, but it's an official disc. And there's got to be identification tag stuff on, on disc to let you know what the software is on the disc, or it could be programmed to learn. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's, uh, there's different options. But P Sony has, Sony, the or at the very least, don't gouge for the re-release. If you're going to sit there and make me buy Final Fantasy 3 again, or Final Fantasy 5 or something like that, so that I can play it. I, that's just an example, because I don't expect to see fucking Nintendo shit on there, but if you're going to sit there and make me pay to have that game when I own it, uh, it for cheap. one of your systems, then make it cheap, like five bucks a pop or something like that. Don't gouge for that shit, because you will have 100,000 people all diving in to buy, but when you're making them 20 and $30, you know, or yeah. at the, or ha like I said, have that reading software that can read that there's data on the disc that belongs to a certain game on a certain system. Okay, you own it, and then you get a discount on the download, or you get to download it for free, even if you can't read the disc. Yeah. They I can know, at least tell what kind of data is on there. Or I know, you know Sony's stance, they've kind of learned from the PS4 launch, is that they're... And I, it was rumors mostly, but I've heard back to like PS... I don't even know if it was, it was either PS1 or PS2, but all games would be playable on the PS5. Like That's like the rumor circulating. And they've come out and said that they have... They've changed their stance on backwards compatibility. So there'd be that. I think there's a high chance that the PS5 would offer that, especially since Xbox done very well with their backwards compatibility and keeping their fans happy. Well, in you'll that absolutely, regard. you'll absolutely be able to play PlayStation Four games on there, oh, and there's yeah. a good chance you might be able to play PlayStation Three games on there. But one in two games, besides the ones that are released slowly here and there, is like these classic renditions that you see on PSN. Like there's, I don't remember which one it was, but there was a, a bunch of talking heads that got together, industry experts, and they agreed that you'd probably see PlayStation 4 and you'd probably see like PS1 and PS2, but not PS3. Or they thought that you would see PS3 uh, and PS4, but not the earlier ones because they're going to be on a service or they're going to be download and you have to pay for them, something along those lines. But one way or another, there's going to be at least a decent amount of backward support and considering they were the ones that started the whole backward support revolution it's a bit disappointing that they were the ones that pulled out of it just because it was going to make the console another ten dollars more expensive or some shit yeah so i uh i think we pr pretty much answered the question um i would I, buy it i would buy it when it comes out i would not buy on release uh, unless there was a exclusive that was kind of pulling me towards it and then i'd look for a bundle that that i that i'd be okay with um but eventually i probably will get a playstation 5 because they will at one point drop an exclusive that i will be wanting to get my grabby hands on to play and enjoy and i will be all over it at that point but until again that that's basically what my current playstation serves as same thing with the switch they are games they are used for games that i cannot play on my computer god of war um or and then I'll maybe like with the division out, even though I really don't care for the setting of that game. Um, if we, if it ever goes on sale, I'd be down to pick that up so we could all play that together kind of thing or something along those lines. Um, <clears throat> but it, it really depends on what they, what, what moving forward they make their priority with these newer consoles. So, um, 
that's about it. I doubt that they'll have upgrading capabilities. I think I think their current system with the mid generation slight upgrade it worked very well. This this generation, I can't see them uh, stepping back on that because it did do so well. A lot of people just went out and bought a pro, even though they had a PlayStation. I've heard people buying multiple pros because they have the uh, different d- unique bundles, like the PlayStation, like the Spider Man or the God of War Pro, and all that other shit. Um, so I, I definitely see that <laughs> I being a think thing. It was worth the money. I don't either. I still he don't to this day. Um, do not think it is. Uh, but because I don't think it's a big enough of a of a boost. The the One X, if the Xbox actually had decent games to play on it, I think that's a a pretty legitimate jump in uh in power that would warrant a, a purchase. But the Pro, I didn't really think so. So we'll see. Um, I'm excited for people that are excited for the next gen of consoles, but I kind of feel like I already have the next gen machine sitting on the floor. I don't have to wait for it kind of thing. Uh, so it would really come down to a really good looking exclusive. But let's move forward. You have anything else you want to add, Sean? Or are you good? No, not really. <laughs> okay. I don't trust any of them anymore. Uh, the decisions they made with the pro bothered me the decisions they made with the four bothered me the shit they cut out because of the and it didn't fail but because the ps3 and it's and it's bit the fat boy that they released was a powerhouse it was it was truly a next generation console and it had all of this advanced capability that they know that nobody tapped they like one two software designers tapped it like the last of us Mm -hmm. tapped into it some and it just never got exploited. And so a machine that was able to do a hell of a lot more than what the 360 could do was getting games that were graphically inferior to 360 because it was easier to write for. So they'd write for the 360 and then port it over. Yeah. And then when they'd port it over, a lot of times they would lose frames. You would lose a lot of capability. Different things like that would happen. I mean, Square, when Square released Final Fantasy 13, somebody did a side-by-side of both games in the... The PlayStation 4 was graphically much, much more beautiful than the... And 13 is a pretty game. But it was just able to give you so much more detail and sec- texture, so many less graphical flaws, because it was a more powerful system, and Square actually tapped into it a teensy bit. But nobody did. So, And it was so expensive, because it had all these additional card ports. You could save data so many different ways. You could use a thumb drive, the 60 million different SD cards before the format kind of condensed into just the one kind of sd you had backwards compatibility for playstation 1 2 and you could play three games on there so you had a full access to your library except for a handful of games and they were constantly improving that i couldn't play uh, my dracon game originally and i could later and that was fucking awesome i loved the ps3 and i love the games it came out for i love the innovations they made with the controllers and when they cut the options off, I knew that Sony was going in a different direction, and that really bothered me. So that when the 4 came out and you couldn't do shit with it, and they had a whole bunch of stuff locked off, and it, it took them forever just to allow you to change your name. I don't know, man. I, then they released the, the 4 Pro. There's no HD Blu-ray drive. They're thinking people are going to be streaming in 4K when even the fastest of internet connections can have problems with that. Like, there's just a bunch of cheapskate ripoffs they did that just were completely unnecessary because they somehow thought that the rest of the world was going to play games the same way they wanted their Japanese to play them. And even the Japanese don't want to fucking play their games that way. I can't. Uh, streaming. Like they or, force a change in the industry. Games. Never mind. Okay. Well, discussion for another time. But, Sam, we appreciate the question. Again, feel free to send us questions, you guys. We will answer anything. Um, from our sexual orientation to uh, this question we just answered today. And I will not answer that question unless I actually receive it. I'm not saying shit about my sexual orientation until I receive a question that asks me about my sexual orientation. Same thing with Sean. Although we all know that Sean is the straightest guy alive and he don't even look at dick besides his own without... Unless it's horse dick. Wait, I like that slow. <laughs> I was, I was, I was gonna make something along the same lines. I was gonna say like, let me break out my fur suit, but it's fine. We're good. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right, let's move on to box office tops, boys. 
not nothing's fucking come out. So obviously, we pretty much all know what number one is Captain Marvel, still holding first place. Made sixty nine million for the weekend. I know Sean, you recently saw it. Do you have a quick synopsis of what you thought about it? Good Captain Marvel. Yeah. Mm. It didn't have an identity. It didn't have a style. It didn't have. It really didn't know what it was. Like I, I felt it was reductive overall. I think that Brie Larson was very not fantastic in that movie. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, it was fun. He was probably was, the best I mean, part of it, to be really honest. Wasn't, yeah, he wasn't really taking it much, much seriously in his acting. Like you'd say, he was just fucking around. But that's okay. I liked the cat. Um, the cat was a fun little addition. I didn't expect them to bring that in, but they completely reversed. And I mean a major reversal. Like they changed an essentially massive part of Marvel canon to fit the story. And they, they, they kind of hinted at doing that when they did Guardians of the Galaxy because they took Roman the Accuser, who's a good guy. I mean, he's been a nemesis on occasion, but then again in Marvel, who hasn't? But overall, Roman the Accuser has never been a villain in the true sense. Like, he's typically been on the good guy's side. He's helped them out. They fought him a couple of times, but he's been beneficial way more than he's been negative. And he was never like that Darth Vader evil style shit he was in Guardians of the Galaxy. So I was worried about they were do- what they were going to be doing with the Kree because the Kree and the Skrulls have been at war forever. And granted, the Skrulls weren't initially a villain race, but through the absolute majority of Marvel history, Skrulls have been bad guys. They've been responsible for more hero deaths, for more catastrophic events. Fuck, a year or two ago, there was a major Marvel event where the Skrulls came in and fucked shit up again. (sighs) So when they kind of flipped the script in this movie, which I've already hinted at strongly enough, I'm not going to go any farther into it. They take one side and another side and just reverse them for some reason. That makes absolutely no sense and was completely unnecessary. And that made me twitch, but I but they don't make these movies for fucking comic book fans anymore. They really don't. Like after Thor three and what they did with with uh, the Accuser, and now this, like this is not for people who like the comic books. And Captain Marvel, her humor, her attitude, her personality was like all over the fucking place. And I don't mean like they intentionally wrote it that way to show her trying to regain her identity. That was not how it worked. Like t- tonally, the movie was just fucking everywhere like i feel like whoever wrote it was really drunk and just not thinking straight so no i don't i don't think it was worth the money that i paid to see it was it passable you know yeah it was like just good goofy two hours worth of time but it's not up to par with the rest of marvel stuff like i wouldn't even say it's up to par with the weaker ones like iron man 3 or iron man 2 or i felt like another thing that i was in the middle door movie i was thinking Another thing about it is, like, they didn't really show off a lot of what she could do, like, as a as a hero either. Like, I don't know the expanse of her powers. But yeah, but even then, it was still the same thing we've seen. It was just at a, at a greater, there was a greater output of what was going on. Um, like, she just seemed overall, like, for someone that's supposed to be absurdly strong, she just felt very like bland like what makes like like for superman what makes him strong is the amount of feats that he can perform from tugging entire yeah. planets to lifting infinity and all that shit that's what makes him so interesting as a character is the level of feats that he could perform and for someone that's supposed to be like up there with the upper echelons of of well, I don't know how high she is up there but like I didn't feel like she was super she- powerful She's um, on par with Thor, just below Hulk. Okay. And the only person that was stronger than Hulk is Sentry, and Sentry's half dead, so. Okay. Well, yeah. I did, Sentry's invulnerable, like, almost, and Hulk is not almost invulnerable, but they're like, close. Yeah, like the entire, so the entire the entire movie. Like, my best part with that was the, the little thing at the end that led into Endgame. I'm not going to say anything else about it. Yeah, that's like the whole reason to see it is, yeah. is, is a stinger. It basically built hype for Endgame. And that, that <laughs> like, that's all it did for me. It's like, now I'm excited to see Endgame. And now they have like the new trailer that came out, hinting into going into the quantum realm or whatever that they talked about in the second Ant-Man. And uh, I, I'm now I'm just more excited for Endgame and kind of sad that I 
spent the money. But the thing is, is the way they released it, if you would have waited for DVD, you would have already seen Endman, Endgame because you're definitely going to go see that. And then you wouldn't have gotten the hype that Captain Marvel provided. So I will say this much. It doesn't really... It gives you a few insights as to where some things came from and so on and so forth. But the end, not even the stinger doesn't really tell you anything. Oh yeah. No about end game. There's nothing in this movie that you need to see to enjoy the rest of the Marvel universe. Like you could skip it entirely and not lose any sleep. Although Ben Mendelsohn was pretty good in it, but he's always good. So, all right, let's move forward. We have wonder park. Don't know what the hell that is. Uh, that second place uh, cartoon, uh, second place pulling 16 million for the weekend. Number three, we have Five Feet Apart. Don't know what that is. Pulling $13 million for the weekend. Number four, we have How to Train Your Dragon. Holding up there with uh, $9 million. Um, sitting at a total of... I still of, want to see that. Sitting at a total That's of, what we should have seen. <laughs> sitting at a total of $466 million. I never got into those. I watched the first one and I thought it was good. I just never watched the rest of them. Number five, we have Tyler Perry's and Medea Family Funeral. Pulling $8 million for the weekend. Sitting at a total of $59 million worldwide. Um... Then some new movies came out. Something called No Manches Frida 2. No, it's in in Spanish? I don't know what this is. It's a comedy. Uh, Captive State came out, which did horribly for its first week and only pulled $3 million. Uh, but I didn't really hear much about that film as a whole. Alita Battle Angel sitting in ninth place with almost $2 million, sitting at a worldwide total of almost $400 million, so that's nice. Enjoyed that movie. That has to be officially a success by now. Oh no, it definitely is because their budget was only 170 million, so they've almost they've practically doubled it. So I, mm-hmm. I definitely think we'll see another film. Thank God for foreign audiences, man. That's all I gotta say. Woo! Thank God for the weebs across shore. That's all I gotta say. <laughs> oh man. All right. Well, that's what's going on in the box offices. Uh, let us know what you guys thought of Catch Tomorrow if you've seen it. If you're excited to go see it, what you thought of it from just trailers, because what I thought of it from just trailers was exactly how I felt coming out of it. Like, it was just average. So, um, let's move forward. we got a what to look for. We've got a few games coming out this week. Um, two, I've actually one that looks interesting. Um, one I've never heard of, and one that a lot of people are excited for. On March 20th, we have Super Robot Wars T coming to Switch and PS4. No fucking clue what that is. At uh, the day after, on the 21st, we have The Sinking City coming to PS4, Xbox One, and PC, which is another Call of Cthulhu-type game, which is, looks very interesting. Um, it actually looks a little bit better than the Call of Cthulhu we received, which was okay. It had some good elements, but had some bad elements as well. I thought it was overall an average game. I would have given it a glowing review, um, but I enjoyed it for what it was. Sinking City does look quite fantastic though i'd like to see reviews see how that uh holds up um i've got that one pre-ordered too dope uh and finally on the 22nd we have sekiro shadows die twice coming to ps4 xbox one and pc or sekiro i don't know how it's pronounced i paid that off uh thursday i don't care about this game currently we'll see how my opinion changes once it releases and everyone's talking about it but as of right now i do not care for it I've been, a, I've been a Dark Souls fan, and the game looks interesting, but it looks like more of an action take, and I just want Bloodborne 2, so well, we'll see. I, well, I'm, that's something I wait for reviews, see what, what happens with that, but I know a lot of people are super excited for this game, and um, from what I've heard from people that have gotten to uh, preview it early and stuff like that, they've said it's very good, so I'm interested. So, let's move on. Got some news. Some very exciting things actually happened for the PC community this week, which we'll delve into. I'm sure you may know about this already if you've been paying attention, but got a few smaller things first. We got Bloody Palace mode coming to Devil May Cry in April. Whoop, whoop. Super exciting. April 1st, it drops. Um, this is the game series staple. It's been in pretty much every iteration of the game, and it is basically a survival-based mode. Um, where you go in, you go basically through increasingly difficult waves of enemies um, while you have a timer ticking down. And they basically have it set up where you'll be able to play as any of the three protagonists, and you can go in through and um, try and get your try and get a good stylish score and get through the levels as, as perfectly as you can manage. 
Um, Devil May Cry did launch earlier this month and has already been a critical and commercial success for Capcom. It debuted at number one in the UK and has garnered anywhere from lows at seven and a half to highs at tens. I think it's gotten a, a few tens. Um, Take note, Capcom, and remember DMC and what we told you when you released DMC. <laughs> what? Maybe now, maybe now you'll believe us next time. Yeah, very, very excellent game. If uh, even I would say, even if you're not, if you haven't played a Devil May Cry game before, I think this game does a good job of introducing you to the game, introdu- introducing you to the franchise, and it's a very good iteration of the franchise. So, uh, from heard from a lot of people that have been huge fans of the game, that this is their favorite Devil May Cry title. Um, I still, I liked three a lot, but again, that was a long time ago, so it may be nostalgia that I'm looking for. But I really, really do like five. I would definitely give it a nine, which I said earlier. Um, I enjoy that game to death. I'm excited for Bloody Palace. I'll definitely be hopping into that when that releases on the first, and uh, will test my skills um, because I was sucking some fat ass when I went through the final fight uh, to beat the boss. I'm not gonna say anything about. <laughs> But if you've played Devil May Cry, you may have an idea of who it is. Actually, you may not if you're still early. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Um, So that's definitely exciting. Cannot wait. Uh, Moving forward, we also have an interesting thing. Recently, there was a Yakuza spinoff that was coming out called Judgment, uh, which had basically the same idea but was not connected to the Yakuza um, franchise. But recently, one of the actors that debuted, or not debuted, but that was in the game, uh, was arrested for cocaine. He had cocaine on him, and he was arrested. And basically, Sega's response, which I find interesting, is they've completely stopped sales of Judgment. So they're not, distri- they're not distri- distributing well, the game. It's, the, it's just they've completely stopped. Um, uh, Sega has received their arrest reports and are currently confirming the facts at the time of uh, well, this this podcast. I don't know if it's still conf- I don't know if it's confirmed at this point because the article that I used to take the notes was uh, a little bit old, like a few days old. So I don't know if it's been confirmed yet. Um, but uh, what was I going to say Judgment already did launch in Japan in Japan back in December, but it was uh, scheduled to arrive in June to the PS4, um, but because of the controversy, they again, they've stopped distribution. Uh, it, it surrounds uh, Taki, one of the characters, uh, or Taki, the the actor, and he plays Kyohei Hamu- Ham- Hamuda. Kyohei Hamuda in Judgment. Yeah, he's voiced by Fred Tadascore, which is so- Soldier 76 in Overwatch, and Zer in Destiny, in the English version. Um, he's an actor and a musician that's been known for being a member of the band Denki Grove, and he's the voice of the snowman Olaf in the Japanese dub of Frozen. Uh, according to the Japan Times, the punishment for the possession of or use of cocaine in Japan is a prison sentence of up to seven years. Um, we haven't really heard full reasoning as to why. They've just completely stopped distribution. I don't know if it's a law in Japan that, like, for the distribution of the money, if I, I don't know how they manage that. You'd think that they'd sign him on to do the voice acting. And once he's done, he probably doesn't make any money from sales that go all to the devs. So maybe they can't make money off of a criminal or something like that. Maybe there's something fucky going on with the laws. And that's why they've had to stop distribution until they figure out what happens. They, yeah. They, Cause they can't be like, I can't imagine them shutting a project down just because somebody gets caught for fucking Coke. I mean, yeah, you're an idiot. You're, Doing hard drugs and gonna fuck your life up and whatever, whatever, whatever. But hey, it's fucking cocaine. It's not like they found a dead kid in his trunk. Yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily know. I think it may have to do something with the, uh, the way that the laws work in Japan. Because I, I, I don't know of another case where something like this has happened. But I don't. If something like this in the states happened, I can't see. Because we've had actors get in trouble for drug use before, but it, I don't think it. We've got trouble for worse. But like. Would it nece- I don't think it would necessarily affect the, any current like airing projects that they have going on. I mean, it may it no. may it may halt future ventures. That's for damn sure because you won't have anyone sign you when you're like a convicted uh, um, criminal and shit like that. But I think it may have something to do with how they receive their money. I have no idea. But Capcom hasn't really commented on it either. As far again, as far as the time of us recording this, so definitely an interesting little thing to happen. Um, 
and uh, be interested to see what happens if this even goes as far as affecting distribution to the West overall. If they even bring this game to the states and see what they do, I have no idea what Cap or uh, Sega has planned. I think I said Capcom earlier. It's not Capcom with Sega, but um, Yakuza the Yakuza games are great though. I definitely recommend you try those out. They're very interesting to say the least. Super awesome, super awesome stuff. So the biggest article that's happened over the last week is uh, it was confirmed that the Master Chief Collection will be coming to PC in the distant future, or not so far distant, but in the future. Um, It was finally made official by Microsoft. They said it'll be coming to PC later this year, 2019. Microsoft said the PC edition was specifically built for the PC audience, but we don't know entirely what kind of PC features may be implemented in this build of the game. Um, They did confirm that they will contain campaign and multiplayer support, uh, which is great. Awesome. One thing I would love to see, and I don't know if if they'll have like co-op campaign over the internet kind of thing. That was my favorite part of the earlier Halos is playing through Halo 3 and doing the missions on Legendary with your friends. I love that shit, and I would love to see that come here as well. Um, Another thing that people are kind of unclear about, and I've seen a little bit of stuff about this on Twitter is that if people own an Xbox One edition of the game, will they get the PC edition for free like the other Xbox Play Anywhere titles? They haven't really said anything about that. Um, But 343 has stated that they are working to critically ensure, basically was their words, that Master Chief Collection for PC is a first-class PC experience, making sure these ports all work well. That doesn't have any issues that the Xbox One edition has. If you guys had it on the Xbox One, you know of the multiplayer problems that happened with the matchmaking early on with it taking forever to do anything in the Master Chief Collection on Xbox One. So um, they're working very hard to make sure that this game does have all the features available and is something that a modern PC can use to the best of its abilities from graphical settings to uh, whatever else that may that, that that statement may involve. But one interesting thing about all this that we've gained as they've continued to talk about it is that these games will also contain it won't contain just Halo Combat Evolved, Halo 2, and Halo 3. They're also planning on including Halo Reach and Halo 3 ODST as well, where Halo 3 ODST only containing the campaign, not the firefight mode. Um, But they plan, as they make these ports, the idea is to, in order to make sure that each one of them is correct, they're releasing them in a staggered schedule in a way. So in order, I think, it's going from Halo Reach... To Halo Combat Evolved, to Halo 2, to Halo 3, to Halo 3 ODST, and Halo 4 will be available for individual purchase within the Master Chief Collection as they become available. So I'm assuming the way it will work is you download the Master Chief Collection for free, and it's like a launcher in a way. And then as these games drop, you'll be able to buy, so like when Halo Reach comes out, if it's if it is in fact the first one. Um... Reach was one of the best Halo games. It was really good. Halo 3 was fantastic too. But uh, when when Halo Reach does in fact drop, uh, when they sit down and, and get it all ready and it's ready to launch, uh, you purchase that and it exists within the Master Chief Collection, the launcher. And as the future Halos launch and they work on patching them and or porting them and getting them all ready to go, they will launch individually for individual pricing. Now they haven't said what the pricing will be, and um, but they have straight up said that each title will be available separately for a separate download and purchase. So you, it's not like you just buy the Master Chief Collection and you have every game. You purchase them as they come out. So Halo Reach will drop. It will be whatever price they think is right for Halo Reach. You purchase it. You own Reach and you have access to it on your PC. Later down the line, Combat Evolve comes out. They make that whatever price um, that that they want it to be. <clears throat> and you get access to Combat Evolved, you buy it, you download it, and it is its own separate download that exists within the Master Chief Collection. You think they would just release a pass and you would get the games automatically when they come out? Yeah. Because how much was the Master Chief Collection? How much did they charge for I think it what was was it, three old games? Master Chief Collection, I think it was 60 for It's like Xbox. $20 a piece, right? Because it was three games initially. Uh, yeah, it was only Halo 1, 2, and 3. 
Um, so if they charge eighty dollars overall for the whole thing for PC, <laughs> that'd be fair. Um, you can get it for thirty now, but I don't know what it was when it launched. I'm assuming sixty. That would make sense. But um, yeah, I I I get the idea of having. They might even in introduce a season pass kind of thing where it's like drop this price you'll get everything as it comes but i get the idea of making sure that everything works perfectly so since these games they shouldn't call it a season pass though oh yeah no but you i get what you get what i'm uh, coming across yeah um i hope that entire terminology just vanishes from the vernacular unless you're (laughs) playing a game that actually functions in seasons yeah um they've also said that for like halo reach specifically players will have access to campaign multiplayer and firefight um, though they did not state if it was clear that all of these would come combined if you just buy Reach, or if they'll be sold separately. Hoping that earlier, you just buy Reach, you have access to all three of those modes, it'd be pretty shitty on Microsoft, especially after all this hype generated. Really do a good job of pissing off the community if they really nickel and dime the fuck out of everybody with these super old games. Um, they said that they'll be launching more, or releasing more details for at the MCC as time progresses. Um, also, 343 is working on the PC edition alongside outside studios Splash Damage and Ruffian, which is uh, interesting. I think Splash Damage was behind, like, what? Uh, Dirty Bomb. They didn't make a really old Wolfenstein title, too. That was pretty big on PC back in the day. Uh, I think it was, like, Enemy Territory was what it was called. Was that Splash Damage? Let's find out. Before I s- just talk out of my ass for no reason. Let's see, splash damage. They created the mod Quake, Quake Three Fortress. Oh yeah. Yeah, okay. they did. I know they, they did enemy territory. They did Brink. They did Dirty Bomb, which failed. And they did Gears of War Four as multiplayer. Garbage. Interesting. Yeah, Gears Wolf- still has hands down the best horde modes. Yeah, dude, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory. I remember hearing so much about that game. Like it was like like in like the top four played games when it was in its prime. Like right underneath like Half Life. It was like a free to play game. Um that's interesting because they, they have a lot of well, they've had a lot of good experience and a, a lot of bad experience with um development on PC shooters. So that'd be interesting to see. Uh, as long as 343 holds them in line, I'm fine. And I don't even know who the fuck Ruffian is. Let's see what they've done. Ruffian. Ruffian devs. Let's see, let's see. Um, Ruffian Games, another British developer. Right? Yeah, another British cool. developer. They worked on Crackdown 2, Connect Playfit, and Fragmental. But they did collaborative... That's embarrassing. <laughs> they did... I would never admit that. Do you, what games have you made? Well, we made three. Well, what are they? Uh, we with this one for PlayStation, and we made another one for computer. What's the third one? We made two. <laughs> you know, um, uh, we didn't work with the Connect. Listen, I didn't even know that was a thing. Was that a thing? Did they have a? Wow, that's a terrible idea. Wait, we did. Thank the, God. We also did. Failed. Oh, yeah, we also did collaborative titles on Connect Star Wars, Nike Connect Training, Connect Sesame Street, Connect Sports Rivals. What? What are you talking about? That wasn't us. <laughs> yeah, man, that's that was that Joel Schumacher guy that fucked up Batman. Yeah, that's yeah. who that was. Wow, they really. I wonder what they'll be doing here because they're only the uh, like they worked on Crackdown 3's Wrecking Zone, which was also, from what I've heard, awful. So, I mean, Crackdown Two is a good game, but that's like the only thing here that sticks out. I don't even know what the fuck Fragmental is. That's 2017. <laughs> Crackdown 3 is embarrassing also. It is embarrassing. But not nearly as embarrassing. Like, how do you spend that much time and then just have a on a game release. that that many people have wanted and then just, it's not, it's like unrecognizably bad. I mean, I, I didn't really think Crackdown was all that good of a game franchise anyway, but regardless, like, you had all that time to fucking make a decent game. And I mean, what do you need for decent in Crackdown? You got to be a superhuman. You got to be able to jump on buildings and shit and run around <laughs> and Terry shoot Cruz. stuff. Like, you need Terry Crews. Yeah. And Terry <laughs> Crews, uh, you think that coincidentally was not in the game. He was the main character he voiced in, didn't he? No, I thought they wanted him for it and they didn't pick no, him they up. They got him in. I think he's one of the main characters. He uh, voices him. He just does voice acting though. Um, one. That's unfortunate that they, they only got him in on this shitty game. Yeah. 
You'd think Terry that Terry Crews deserves better. Yeah, you'd think that Microsoft would kind of like watch that a little bit more closely, make sure that that game's actually being developed properly for something that's like one of the few exclusives that they have. It's pretty crazy that they like the only thing keeping them alive is Halo, and now it's coming to PC. Why even own an Xbox at this point? Like it's fucking insane. Well, the sports titles, like all your sports players are typically going to be playing on i don't know why but like that's really where their biggest audience is is like the fifa crowd yeah not that there aren't a shitload of fifa players on sony but i don't know who else is really buying xbox i mean all of the shooters maybe on the one x i guess they would look better better frame rate i don't know man i haven't been able to figure out why xbox is still a contender even though they have they currently the one x is a superior piece of hardware it's only superior by a couple of inches it's not even a massive so weird that they i hate that half step shit just save your money and make a massively better console in four years i mean if people are gonna buy it then of course they're gonna keep i mean if they'll if they they're ultimately making profit all this shit because of the fact that how much r&d are we losing by by making you know focusing on making something that's only a half step up with current tech instead of well if it is only a know, half I step just, i guess it would depend yeah how much you do lose but if it is a small improvement then i can't see them losing much and it could be something that a skeleton crew works on over time while the main team is working on developing the next system i have no idea uh one more article we have i don't know what the hell that was i just did with my mouth but um so because <laughs> I don't of, know, but it tickles my bowels. Because of the news of Master Chief Collection coming to PC, there's been an interesting little fun thing that's been going on with the community. Apparently, because of the the crazy amount of um excitement for Master Chief Collection, people have been sending pizzas to three four three studios, like or three four three industries, whatever their name is. Like ordering and having people deliver pizza to the to the company like in massive amounts like to the point where they actually had to go on to Twitter to tell people guys stop buying pizza for the studio like the, there's way too much pizza like i don't know how the hell this ended up happening but because of all of this 343 came back and released a pizza themed gift for every Halo 5 player called the Pizza Party Rec Pack which includes a pepperoni pizza themed weapon skin and a uh a a banner for the character um <clears throat> maybe they did something cool like take all the extra pizza and give it to the homeless or something that'd be pretty rad that would be nice but the reason it was pizza that was being sent is um the way that the game had been confirmed like for steam it referenced pepperoni mm-hmm. pizza so Everyone that was excited, they just like, you know, oh, that was cute. We're gonna send you a like a metric fuck ton of pizza. Um, so, and another cool thing that Microsoft did not have to do, but they did, which was awesome, is that the not only is Master Chief Collection coming to PC, it's coming to Steam as well, which a lot of people are excited for because no one really likes the Windows Store. I'm not gonna lie. So the fact that it's actually dropping on Steam, which is everyone's really preferred area to how's their games has people super excited on top of that especially with the halo games being so socially like the whole thing is like the social aspect of the halo games like imagine you have all your friends on steam but now you have to migrate everyone to the windows store to play these games actually kind of thing so i could see that being a problem so that was interesting um and that was pretty much the rest of our news. I had one thing that kind of happened that had to involve with the that was involved with the Epic Store that we can talk about for a bit. That's interesting that we've seen actually been going on for a while. I don't know how interested you'd be, Sean, but it deals with like uh the competition going on with like the PC distribution market right now. Or I think it's interesting. Or because we don't really have a main topic. There's nothing really interesting to me going on. So it's either that or we brainstorm a main topic right here. You know, do something new. I, I don't While know. we're recording? While we're recording. <laughs> While we're recording. I can go... How about this? We can see if we can figure out something that, would, that we could talk about while I present the story with the Epic Games, and I'll just briefly go over it, if we, and then we'll 
discuss something else. But again, like I looked around, like the biggest thing that happened this week was the Master Chief Collection. I mean, you, you just kind of talk about that for 10 seconds and you got really nothing else to really converse about. Um, so, yeah. So, basically, what had happened... So, recently, actually, before this whole article, or the, before this whole, this whole debacle had dropped, um, Epic had announced that they were creating their own store, right? They were going to have games that were free every month. They were going to be giving developers a larger cut of their sales, which is really nice because that in turn creates cheaper, cheaper games. Um, usually that that's the case. And we did see that. Um, but one problem that was happening is that a lot of games were trying to jump on this bandwagon for distribution last second. So a problem that we were coming into and we saw it, the first major step was with Metro Exodus, uh, before that game had fully launched three weeks. In fact, before that game had dropped, they had announced that they had signed an exclusivity deal with Epic Games for a whole year. So if you wanted to play Metro Exodus, you would have had to use the Epic Games launcher for an entire year, and then eventually it would have come to Steam. Now, this doesn't it's not really a bad idea when you think about it from it from a general point of view. The major issue that people have with this idea is the fact that one even if you pre-ordered phys- physical versions of the game, Sean, that came with Steam codes, you instead got an Epic game code, so you had no way of getting it on Steam or on Geo. I don't know if it came went to GOG, actually. Um, I, I know don't the, think it did. I know the story that we're going to be talking about afterwards. Um, there, it, 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 there was GOG promised, but... Uh, so... People that did were getting Steam copies are no longer getting Steam co- or Steam codes are no longer getting Steam codes. Everything's Epic now, and the problem is that the Epic launcher is in a rough state in its current state. Um, from one major problem being that Epic currently is owned by Tencent, which is a very big investing, uh, a Chinese investing firm. And they own a lot actually from Riot Games, which manages. I didn't know they owned it. I thought they uh, were. Or they own some stock, but I know they were majority shareholders. I think that's like forty percent. So maybe not majority. Let's find out. Uh, well, yeah, but if they're forty and no one else owns that much, then they're still majority shareholder. Does Tencent like own you? Epic I mean, if you games? own ten percent and everybody else owns five each, and you own ten, you got a majority stake mm. over anybody else. You have more per se. Uh, let's see. I think they are like a. Pro- they're like a they they're under Tencent from what I understand. Let's see, they're like a subsidiary of Tencent. That's whatever. true. That would explain why fucking uh, why my video game series got shit on. Yeah. Well, Tom, Tencent doesn't give a fuck about. The only other owner is Tim Sweeney, which I'm assuming is the CEO. He has more than fifty percent stock, but Tencent owns forty percent stock. They're the only other person. The only other the only other owner is is the founder of Epic Games. So they own, they're an outside party that owns majority stock. Um, they, they kind of are the reason that, uh, like Paragon got butt fucked, um, eventually, uh, outside of the way that Epic Games took that game and ultimately destroyed the, uh, the user base. Um, but, uh, like, that's a conversation for a completely different time. Uh, cause Paragon. No, I like Unreal. Unreal Tournament is one of my favorite shooters. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I get what you're saying, like the uh, everyone hopping on the Fortnite train because Tencent probably is like, oh, this is our biggest cash cow. You guys are going to stop doing everything else and put. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but basically uh, what it came down to is um, people were finding that there were security breaches, like large security breaches. And the one thing is Tencent has been known in the past for selling data so like uh, and not that it's, it's a chinese company what do you expect <laughs> yeah but um no, i'm not i don't mean to sound racist it's like the entire <laughs> culture over there is about an invasion of privacy yeah you know the government owns your company you're only allowed to make decisions as long as the government approves those decisions so like it's been notorious like that other one that that's that a uh, tech company that used to make knockoff systems like knockoff nintendos and stuff and okay. now they make uh next gen cell phones oh so the and, uh, like advanced hardware soldier boy right are they called away or... <laughs> no 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 yeah but like, yeah soldier boy yeah yeah 
um, I can't remember the fucking company's name right now, but uh, this is no different. Like if the government says, hey, we want you to give us the uh, the information you have from your American player base, they will absolutely do it. They don't have a choice. That's the problem with why everyone has with teaming up with Chinese companies now. Because for a while there, it was smart business and Chinese companies were eager to fucking move forward with stuff. But now that the the Chinese government has gotten openly hostile towards things again, or I should say more obviously openly hostile towards things, it's complicating matters. Yeah. And I think that's making it more difficult for Chinese businesses to do stuff with other countries because the other countries uh, don't know if they're safe. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and not that of those areas, and not that the collection of data is necessarily something that no one else is doing. Like you couldn't necessarily like I've had talks with other people about this, and we can't prove that Steam isn't collecting and 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 selling advertising data or shit Very like true. that. Um, but it's the idea that this again is a foreign owned company, whereas Valve is t- is is founded in the U.S. kind of thing, and. It it just has a lot of people when, there, and there's been no major breaches recently on Steam. I know they've had issues in the past, but for the most part, their service is stable. It does they haven't had any huge security breaches, and like the Epic Launcher has had a few, and since it, in its running life cycle, so that has people worried, which makes sense. And not only is it, there's a few things because it's not only the fact that. Um, um, cause there's a huge majority of the internet that is, that has issues with the launch as a whole for multiple reasons. Um, but there's a few things that I've noted down here that steam does have that Epic does not for say. So from things to, uh, cloud saves, Epic does not support that in its current state. And although it being in a more basic state isn't bad if they fix it in the future you'd expect like one of the largest video game companies right now at least in income for how much money they're making off of fortnite and stuff like that you'd think that they'd take the time to properly create a feat or feature rich launcher if they were trying to be a competitor to steam not only in the dev market with offering them a larger sum to make the games cheaper but on the actual consumer side um, with providing them an environment that they've gotten used to. Like the thing, the problem with Steam is it's had the last 15 years to create features and manage its systems. So if you want to step into this market, this the distribution of video games on, on PC, you have to be willing to create a product that can hold a candle to the, to the major competitors, the people that have a huge, huge amount of trust and... Uh, and and um and uh, consumer base you have to be able to compete with them in all aspects and if you're making a shitty launcher i could see why people wouldn't want to move to that a lot of people just say oh hey you could have two launchers it's not a big deal but when the launcher is so bad where things like not having cloud saves not having forums not having um linux and mac os support not having offline play um, not having regional pricing, not having uh, like user reviews and everything of, of that nature, even to the point when it first released, it didn't even have a search bar. You couldn't search the store. They have one now, but it's just something that being so... F- it seem like a alpha release or something like it seems a very unfinished for yeah, it's inc- something as simple as a launcher. And it's, it's incredibly basic in nature. So I could see why people want to avoid it and forcing people to exclusively have to use it. Um, just people, they, they just, they're not going to, if you don't provide enough features to make up for the fact that a game's actually cheaper, because it's like, it's the games are like 40 something bucks. Um, like Metro is 40 something bucks on the Epic launcher. Um, and if people aren't willing to take the, the step down in the features that are provided, like, I heard I was listening to someone talk about it. Um, I don't remember their name, which is awful. Because, but hey, we're not we're not the facts here. That's for damn sure. But uh, they say that with issues with regional pricing, depending on where you live, just the distribution to your computer, like connecting to the server, can cost you upwards of additional twenty to thirty bucks on top of the game's price because regional pricing isn't implemented. Where Steam does 
take the 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 cost on their end so you can still get the game at the price that everyone else has and epic just doesn't do that in its current state so it makes even like for someone that lives in the states it might not be as much of a problem but if you have people living in countries that do have issues with game distribution um like australia and some of the european countries um i can see it becoming a reason why you would avoid this launcher like the plague and and as well as much as it's good for competition to have a someone to stand up to steam and tell them like oh hey there's another there's another there's another competitor out there that does game distribution you have to kind of look at your ways to make sure that you're not losing uh um a consumer base uh they have to take an actual step forward that's not half assed and that's the problem i have with what it is in its current state um if you want to compete in a market that's been around for a very long time you have to make sure you're competing with the best of your ability to make sure that you provide the environment that's existed for so long for the consumers if you want to drag them over to your side you can't just say you you've been fucking um there's a i'm trying to think of a good analogy here but i'm not going to think of one because i suck ass at these um but i like that they're terribly bad and everyone tries to like think of like what what is this man saying so i'm gonna try and come up with one real quick um say like you have a maid service right and they clean your whole house for the same price. They clean your entire fucking house for a set, a flat rate, whatever. Um, and they're they're pretty dominant in the area because they're a good service. Uh, they they have a lot of features for their uh, their consumer base uh, from putting little chocolates, happy ending, happy endings, putting little chocolates in the pillows after they fold them and stuff like that. And you have a new maid service come in the in the town, a little bit smaller, but they they they're pretty they're pretty up and coming they're boasting um that we'll do it cheaper we'll do it cheaper and we treat our maids a little bit better than the other service does but but we're not cleaning your whole fucking house (laughs) toilet that shit ain't getting swabbed we'll do the rest of your house toilet ain't getting swabbed i'm not cleaning your sink not doing your fucking dishes you can do that yourself but we'll be a little bit cheaper well we're not providing all the services these other maids provide now if someone takes both these and compares them next to each other and the price is only like a 15% difference but they're not getting their whole fucking house cleaned and they need the whole fucking house cleaned they're going to stick with the people that provide the better service now I know that was an awful analogy and I hope you all expected an awful analogy because that's what I do around here awful analogies yeah, it was a little. I think you worked too hard at it I think there was a lot of effort that went into that they didn't need to but listen, I, I got think my... you're getting better and you tried and hey listen dude I love you Thank you. I, it's it's you, hot in here. You, you, you. My head's spinning. I got the fan off, so it doesn't make any noise on the mic. And uh, my balls are stuck to my ass crack. So I'm, I'm just uncomfortable. And I had to think while having the notion of the fact that my balls are stuck to my ass crack in the, in the, in the back of my mind. Yeah, nobody and, wants ass balls. No, That's and it just made that so much more difficult than I originally intended it to be. But... <laughs> the that that's the idea and i and i get it usually the internet overreacts that's their job and i feel like there's a slight overreaction here especially if you live in the states and you don't really have to deal with other things like some of the more major issues like regional uh regional pricing and offline play and shit like that um i could get that but people are that have the right to their opinion and especially in a consumer friendly marketplace people should be able to vote with their wallet and you shouldn't tell someone they're dumb because they don't want to spend money on a company that's giving them less features kind of thing. So, and again, you're, you're uh, uh, eligible to your own opinion in, in the opposite of that manner, blah, blah, blah. But I understand where people are coming from. And that from what I've heard from like surrounding Metro Exodus and this new game we're going to talk about real quick, that not only is it the biggest problem here is that it's being done late in the development cycle. Especially with this new game, it's called, it's called Phoenix. Ooh, fuck. It's called Phoenix Point. It's made by one of the devs that broke off from the XCOM team and went to go make his own game. So it's an XCOM style game. And it was entirely fundraised. Um, basically, they it was fundraised. They signed a deal with Epic late in the development cycle. And that deal forced exclusivity. So they're now they're exclusive to um, Epic, the Epic launcher. Where, even if you look on the, the, the game's website... In their frequently asked questions, they have, will this be coming to GOG? Will this be coming to Steam? 
And up until the deal was announced, that was the case. People who backed the game early were getting those copies. So they were promised the fact that they would be re- uh, getting a Steam copy and or getting a GOG copy, depending on what they chose when they backed the game. But now, all that's kind of fucked because they've, dis- they've signed this deal. Now, the good thing with these exclusivity deals is it's more money going into the game's development for future content and stuff like that, so that it's not necessarily all bad. And I can understand a dev's choice in doing this, but fr- from what I understand from the stories, the devs have actually come out and said that even if, even if every single backer goes and requests a refund for their 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 backing money, they will still be in the black. Which means that every single person that funded the game at this point could pull out entirely and get full refunds, and the game would still be in a financially stable position. So with that deal signed, at this point, it's just like, it's almost as like, for a, first of all, don't back games. Like, you're basically making an, an investment that has no guarantee that it will actually surmount to anything. You're taking a huge chance with a lot of, a lot of like, kick, like, uh, fundraising and kickstarting things, especially in, the, in video games. It's, video game development is such a lengthy uh, process, and it takes so much money, and a lot of times things can get larger or smaller than they should be. Look at, um, what's it fucking called? Uh, what's that space game that's never coming out? Oh, uh, Star Citizen. Star Citizen. Yeah. That that's that's fundraising and kickstarting to one of its worst elements, and the idea of feature bloating things. Just keep throwing shit in there, and hopefully people keep giving money and throwing shit in there, and then before you know it, you have a game that's too big for its own britches, and they just keep. Then the team expands. Now you need more money, and people keep throwing money. And now there's stretch goals, more and more and more and more stretch goals, more and more and more shit. And in this type of game, they can just do that. It's a space game. You can have so much shit you can add to these types of games. They could. They Star Citizen was was actually what they were talking about. If it was actually the three different kind of games seamlessly transitioned into one, that would be amazing. But I don't think we're at. Uh, I. Uh, they would have either had to have designed one perfectly and then designed an additional module and added it and so on and so forth. I still don't, I just don't know how you can make that work I all know. in one engine. Cause I mean, you have a first person shooter, first person shooter element space. It's pretty space based exploration, um, you know, in ships or small craft and you got to have the physics and all that. Normally those are two completely separate engines. And then on top of that, you have, all of the mechanics that go behind it and the different factions and controlling all that shit and then all of the customizations and what I don't understand how you're gonna you're gonna do that. I just that's so much work. With two hundred million they dollars. To do it with a tiny <laughs> tiny team. Well they've expanded they've got enough money to do it, but they've they expanded needed a bigger team. team. Well early they they were way too small for what the product the yeah, product like they had. people. Yeah, but they've they've expanded to like four offices now or some shit, and now everyone's just wondering if this game will ever come. Every out. time they expand, they need more money. Yeah, and you gotta think, Richard Gary, the guy who did the Wing Commander series, is the perfect dude to be behind this. Oh, definitely. And they've got all these all these voice actors that have already recorded their lines, like Gary Oldman and all these famous like big time actors. That's cool. Like it's it's got all this stuff going for it, but there's something that just seems off. Because I want to play Star Citizen. I'd love to play that game. I'd love to play the game they advertise, not the shit that's out now. And they've been in Alpha for God knows how long. They have that... Like four that, years? Five uh, years? Dog, dog fighting demo has been out for like two or three. Yeah, the arena mode or whatever. Yeah, it's been it's yeah. it's been a weird... It's been a weird thing with Star Citizen. But the... Going back to... Oh, fuck, I don't even know where we were. But... um. The problem with Phoenix Point, I think is what that was called here, is the idea that this, I like the idea of getting developers money, getting them funded. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of exclusivity as a whole. I like competition without exclusivity. I, cause I, I, I think that I just feel like it's kind of counterproductive in, in a way. I don't know. I, I just, I'm just not a fan of it. I don't know, but I'd rather it, if you want people to come to your service, the idea is not to piss them off by forcing them to come to your service. 
like by forcing them to come to your service for for a thing um you provide other methods that keep you in good grace with your community especially since a lot of the idea behind these behind games for a long time especially on PC is the idea that you you buy it and you have it you can get the files you have access to it and it's your game I, and I know Steam has had issues with that in the past with the DR, the whole DRM controversy and shit like that um and it's just something that exists solely to you and it doesn't it's not like a license from a company kind of thing and I just want to see I don't want to see us falling back in the competition. So like you have all these companies fighting each other and then the, you have the consumer base on the bottom getting fucked because they're not just, they're not doing it properly. And Epic is, I think Epic is taking this the wrong way. Um, in, in that regard, I like, the, I trust me. I don't think they're awful people. I don't think I just, I think their launcher is awful, but I think that, if you're going to take the time to take steps that are consumer friendly, like offering more to the devs, making the games cheaper because of that, and doing stuff like that, um, you'd want to kind of not take a half ass step forward. So keep yourself fully consumer friendly in that regard. Make it where people around the world can enjoy your title. You're not fucking over certain countries again with like regional pricing. Um, you're not dealing with issues with your launcher, with people being afraid that they'll have their data sold and shit like that to foreign countries. It's just, it's just, it just breeds this air of distrust surrounding the launcher. No one wants to use it. Um, and it, it's just weird. And the, I, I just don't think that, I know this is new and they're trying to acquire stuff for their platform to pull people over, but you don't go back on what's going on and all, a lot of the going back and all that shit is as a hundred percent on the publisher's fault because they signed the deal in the first place. Epic didn't hold a gun to their head. That's not what I'm trying to say. It's not Epic's fault that these people are getting screwed because they're not getting steam copies. Um, it is a hundred percent the publisher, the developer's fault for going through with the deal. Um, when they've already promised, <coughs> um, up front that there will be these versions of the game available. Think of it in the sense of, say, like, although it's not as much investment, but say you have a game that's, that's, um, uh, say you have a game that's, uh, it's advertised as being on the, the, the Switch. It's coming out to the Switch and blah, blah, blah. So you go out, you're like, wow, this game looks fucking awesome. Again, there's not as much investment in, in this, in this analogy, but this game's fucking awesome. I'm excited to see what's going to come from it. I love the Switch. I'm going to go out and buy me a Switch. And then come to three weeks before the game actually releases. Um, now they tell you that it's not coming to the Switch. It's coming to the PS4. And you're like, well, shit. Now what do I do? <laughs> I, don't have, I, I, I don't have access to this game. And although you could just say, like, oh, download the launcher. But if someone's not if someone's not a fan of the launcher, they're afraid of the launcher, again, for the prior reasons, the reasons that were provided, they're not going to download the launcher. They're going to wait till it comes to whatever they feel comfortable using. It's not a lot. Of, I, it's not just the thing that like, oh, I don't want multiple launchers because I don't want them cluttering my computer. It's the fact that they're they They don't want to use Epic's launcher because of the state that it's in. So, it's just, it's a very weird and interesting thing, kind of growing pains, I feel, as we get, as this, this story progresses from the first announcement that Epic will be launching a store to compete with Steam. I'm all for having Epic be a competitor to Steam. Don't get me wrong. I just want them to be not in the sense that they are a competitor in just existing within the market, but actually taking the time to be a proper competitor. Like if you're, you make a good launcher, bring people to your system, not just with games, but keeping everything again, a solid, a solid step forward. If you want to compete against something that's been on top for the past 15 years, that's my bitch with, uh, with Epic and their launcher. 
Um, I don't even have it on my computer. And one thing that I found was interesting is I was listening to people talk about it. Apparently, when you download it, it just starts downloading Fortnite without even asking you. Like, it was like, oh, yeah, this is why you're here, right? It's like, no, <laughs> I don't want the fucking Fortnite on my system. You get that shit away from me. Um, but I, I, I see both sides of the argument with this. A lot of people are like, just if you want to play the game, just play it. And I could see the idea of not wanting information collecting on you and sold to a foreign company. Or the idea of having to deal with regional pricing, paying additional for a product just because you live in a certain, a certain part of the country. Or a certain part of the world. Dog? So maybe come back there. Beat your ass. All, all 100% of its cuteness. Um, so I haven't really... Uh, I think if there's anything else I've missed, because a lot of this is from what I've heard, what I've seen. I didn't compile my info together, which we never do here, which is stupid, but we just ramble. I think the final thing that I missed is that the company is providing refunds to devs, so you can get your money back, which is a good, it's a good spot on them. It's appreciated. Um, the way they're doing it is interesting. They're doing it through like, through like a third party company that, uh, again, it's uh, there's a sense of distrust around it. People aren't really too sure about it. Um, but as a whole, I think that they're kind of in a recovery mode. They're trying to do some damage mitigation, and I, at least I feel like they're not. It's nice that they're offering the refund. That's the biggest thing here. Um, it sucks that the game's not coming out how you wanted it to, and you have features missing. But you can get a refund, so I don't feel like. I feel like disappointment is indeed warranted, but I don't feel like straight up anger um, is. But I, f I definitely can feel a disappointment with the developers, with the game, um, and having to wait for whatever that exclusivity deal to come up. Because the game will eventually come to Steam. It's just I gotta wait a year. So I can see that being incredibly disappointing, and I get that side of the argument. But um, it's definitely, it's a weird thing. Again, definitely a 2019 kind of problem. Like, oh, I have too many launchers and one of them shit. And I can't play my game. It's definitely something that's not, not super important, but I just thought was interesting seeing how the internet's reacting to this as, uh, again, we see growing pains with this whole market diversity coming up. Ooh, there's a lot of talking. Usually Sean does all the talking, especially when we talk about things I don't know anything about. Uh, do you have any any idea or any opinion on this? Because again, it's again it's a PC kind of problem. Um, what do you think, Sean? They uh, they abandon Unreal Tournament so they can go fuck off. <laughs> they did also fuck over Paragon, but again, I think it was it was a lot of it was. It wasn't just Tencent too. A lot of it was Epic not understanding what people wanted, at least in in Paragon's thing. But it was it was. It, I would I, say caring and understanding are two words that are not uh, <laughs> interchangeable. Like, yeah. They didn't care what people wanted. They knew the money was pouring into one than the other faster, so they canceled the one where it wasn't as profitable. Yeah, and then they uh, they dumped their souls into the well of a hellspring, and at, at uh, least with Unreal, they wallets. at least with Unreal they made the game open source, which is nice, so the community can develop it to their own desire. But I can see that being again disappointing. Like you're super excited for a new game, their flagship. Yeah, well, that's what, what made the company. That's what they're all of their engine graphic engines are named after. Is yeah. the first Unreal game. Yeah. Which was, by the way, a super fun adventure shooter. I really liked that game. That game was fun too. And it was a, it really pushed systems at the time. There's a, uh, I can't remember what the fucking guy's name is. LGR episode dedicated around the original Unreal game. So I think it's LGR. Anyway. So uh, I'm gonna. Extend... I don't. I think the the competition's fine. I, I do think, too. I think that's a good thing. I just think that it's extremely stupid, greedy. And destructive to the business as a whole to release unfinished software and shit that's not ready because that hurts everyone because you're so fucking greedy that you want to jump off the couch before you fucking put your shoes on, you stupid piece of shit. <laughs> I, I would agree fucking that. Sit back down, 
finish your shit and then put it out there. Yeah, because it's not like Steam is going anywhere and they were already making... Because I would understand if it was a company that wasn't Epic, but these people have made so much money. Like, it, you'd think it would be their job to offer the utmost in terms of addressing customer concerns in the PC market with wherever they store their games. They should not be releasing half-made shit. It's just, it boggles me, even to the degree that it, someone sat down, looked at this launcher, and thought, it's okay that this thing that has a store in it doesn't even have a fucking search bar on it. Like, just that idea boggles me. It's like, we'll just, we'll just add them in later. And we don't know how much they even plan to add in to the fact that it's just Doesn't something... It just seem like a bunch of companies are making these childish, like, <laughs> mature mistakes, like fucking Anthem's release, and The Division won its first release, and, like, all these pieces of software that are coming out, like, unfinished, broken, etc., by companies that have a track record of being able to finish games. Like, yeah. EA's been around for fucking ever. They've released a lot of finished products. So why now is it like you're just crippled and you can't release games anymore? Why Why are you all of a sudden completely diptarded? This makes no sense. I think and the trend is, is just getting worse and worse and worse. And now it's not just games. It's fucking launchers, too. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, I, I, I feel like if you fucking do a misstep this big right out the gate, you should just have your license removed. You're not allowed <laughs> to do it anymore. Give it to someone else. You're done. Just go back to doing your gay-ass Fortnite. <laughs> and uh, and we'll get somebody else to do your job because you obviously can't handle it, you stupid fuck shits. Where's my Unreal? Listen, listen. Um, I guess that was the side of the argument I wasn't really looking at. The Unreal, the Unreal Squad. People are just mad that the game, <laughs> the game, just been discontinued. This in maintenance mode. I don't even know if it's in maintenance mode. I think they just released the code. There's not just not actively developing it anymore. It's crazy how many games that or just seeing older franchises die out definitely interesting um this quake is in the same boat going through the same shit i mean they have their free to play game but they're nowhere near as large as they used to be but uh that's because they didn't put the effort in you don't put the effort in what do you expect yeah it's fucking ridiculous so for the, I'm going to extend this conversation to the people tuning in. What do you guys think? Do you think, oh, hey, it's just a launcher? What's the big deal? That I understand. I, and I think that it, it is not a big deal. But it, a lot of it comes down to where you are. If you need features like offline play, regional pricing, and you're, you, act, you are actively getting fucked by the lack of functionality in a launcher, I could see that angering you. Like, it makes sense. That's completely fine. But for like uh, the United States, I, I like I think the biggest thing is the regional pricing. To be honest, offline play kind of sucks too. I mean, if you're like on a laptop or something, having issues in that regard. Um, but it's just it's more of the it's more the principle that you'd expect a company that is large and has made billions of dollars in the last few in the last year or two, all in one product, would have enough money to launch something that even be considered decent. It's not even considered decent, like, but it's broken in its current state. And you, and in if it was another company, like, they get the same shit. Fallout seventy six when it launched on PC got the same exact shit because its launcher was trash. Even to the point where it deleted people's preloaded information. Like you could preload the game, and apparently that patch was empty. So you just spent seventy, you just spent a day downloading seventy six gigs of nothing, and you had to re-download the game when it launched. Everyone gave them so much shit, but just because it was, it, at that point, it was fine to give them flack for having a broken launcher, it's just okay. And then now all of a sudden, because it's epic, I've heard people defend them in the regards that it's just a launcher. If it's the only way that you have of playing a game, and it does not work, then that's a problem. So that, that's just, that's the biggest issue here with the PC community. And I agree for the most part. I'm more on the fact that if it is your job to provide a product to your, to your consumer base and you fail at that job, you should be told you failed so that when you try again or when you work to fix that failure, 
that you know why you have failed. They know that there's no functionality in their launcher, or there's not a lot, so they're working on fixing it. That's fine. The fact that if it stays as it is for longer than a year or six months, then there's there's something going on, and they shouldn't be getting money. They shouldn't be focusing on pulling people to their system with games. They should have a basic, basic um, launcher in play before they focus on trying to bring people over. It just makes sense. It shouldn't not be that way. Imagine a new console launches. Again, shitty analogy. Real quick one, though, this time. A new console launches. You can only play certain games on that, but its online service is awful. Like, PlayStation's had that issue before. That it had issues with its online service, and you even pay for that, and people were obviously mad with that because it lacked some functionality compared to other online services. So, obviously, people told them what was wrong, and they fixed it. That's just what people are doing right now. People are not going to touch Epic's launcher until they crack down, make it a competitive launcher to Steam, to other alternatives, and then people use it again. People won't have a problem. That's the biggest thing here. We've sat on this topic way too long. Uh, I guess that was enough for a main topic. It was just me rambling, but we're almost two hours in now. Uh... Sean, you got anything to add? Yo, <laughs> yo, no, no, it's not the, uh, not the most riveting of subjects for me, a non-PC person. But hey. I did, I do love Ultra Unreal, and I think their engine's really great. And I think Fortnite's a piece of shit. Um, but I don't like, uh, well, what's that genre that I fucking think is worthless? Battle Royale. Uh, Battle Royale, yeah. Ah. <laughs> I love the movie though. The movie's fucking fantastic. Oh yeah, I, like, I still haven't had the guts to watch the second one because I've heard it it flips the script a couple times. But eventually, I'll watch it because I love it. But I don't, I don't think uh, I'm not a big competitive games person unless I'm playing with a group of my friends. And the those games really only allow small groups anyway. Yeah, I. If it was more like tribes, it'd be a little different because tribes you had squads of like 12 or 24 or some shit like that and they were these big battles and you could boot up into teams and run i mean that was different but you could or if there were jobs in the group that make you feel more useful and maybe yeah the problem i have with those games yeah. is they're they always innately have a random nature to them like it just happens like encounters are not always the same and that's a lot of people say that's what the allure is it makes the game play loop different every time because you're having encounters in different areas and the no two games are the same kind of thing that's the idea but i'm not a fan of that in realms of a, a competitive environment because i don't like not being in control in a competitive environment um yeah i think there's that and like it's not fun like, there's a way for competitive to be fun, you know? Like, there were, like, for instance, Overwatch, I actually had fun playing, you you know? and But Overwatch, you, you like, you're, I don't know, it was just, it was a different texture. And even then, I didn't love the game, I just liked it a lot, mm -hmm. because it was fun to play, the characters were fun to get to know, but, but there was personality there was lore there was a lot of little things to notice the game was always expanding in bits and pieces you yeah. don't see that with overwatch like the lore hasn't grown at all there's no personality to the game whatsoever you've got a bunch of blank caricature cartoons who dance and and have silly weapons but there's like zero personality there's zero story there's zero anything to learn unless you're playing versus the what world which about? i can't get anyone to play oh we're but, talking about fortnite i mean I'm, i've shifted over to fortnite yeah like, i would say there's just a massive difference in personality and style i don't think that fortnite has any of that i think the only thing fortnite it's, has it's going for it in in that regard is the <clears throat> the the art design like the look like the cartoony look that's the only thing but I, I agree with like the lack of personality to it i could i could see that pretty generic besides it being just goofy um i do th i do not agree though i think fortnite has a bit of a skill gap and things to learn especially with the building involved at least in the battle royale environment that's one of the reasons i never I'll could get into that i could never get into it was because i never took the time to learn how to build because it would just frustrate me and i didn't give enough of a fuck about the game to sit there and dedicate time to making myself better 
So I, I just I thought I just, the building works really well in the PVE. I just think the PVE doesn't feel like it's going anywhere, and I think that's the part that eventually drives me out. Is I never feel like I'm progressing towards something. Like the story is opening up every so often. There's this really cute or really well written reference or pop culture thing or like story bit, and you're like, oh, that's nice. And then you have another 200 hours of doing the <laughs> same four missions over and over again before it happens again. Yeah. And I'm just like, uh, I really thought like it's got so much potential. It just doesn't capitalize on it. And the building functions really neat because you can design fortresses and actually use smarts and strategy to defend yourselves against, against the oncoming tide. But even then it's either you get wiped out or it's easy. There's no, like you're constantly by the skin of your teeth kind of situations. Like the, when it first early on, like when they were still figuring it out like a year ago, I was actually a better PVE experience than it is now, which is weird to me. I think we were just having a lot more fun with it and we were exploring and the, and I don't know. It's just, it's it loses its magic. And I, I, I just don't, I don't find when the focus is just going off and fighting other characters and that's the entire point of the game. That only has so much appeal to me. When I'm playing with friends, it can be fun, but it's very short bursts. Like if they could make games like that deeper, maybe get a bunch of different positions, and maybe uh, maybe somebody who's not a precision fighter could still stand a chance on the battlefield. Maybe make it a role that doesn't involve precision, make them super durable, and they carry a shield. And maybe they go out in front and take damage. You know, something where you give people. A variety of roles rather than everybody's in the same exact fucking role and it's the same exact i don't know it's just always the same experience for me apex does that to a, to a degree but <clears throat> i think apex would be my favorite battle royale experience just because it's polished and not fortnite so but um yeah again I'd, apex I'd be, looks good yeah i haven't started because i don't have anybody to play with and i will not ever be interested in playing a battle royale game by myself it's pretty fun. We we would need to sit down one day and see if we can get like a third and try and play a few games since I could play it without having to spend uh, for the service since it's free. Um, all right. I think that'd probably conclude our episode. I hope you all have had a good week. I most certainly have. I'm excited for the week coming up. Excited to get back into some of the games we've been grinding away at. Don't give a fuck about The Division 2. Let us know if you do. And if you're mad at me for saying I don't give a fuck about The Division 2, I just don't like the scenario. I don't give a fuck about it either. You can be mad at both of us. Solidarity, brother. Dope, dope. We fall together. So, before we go, as always, John. I think kids is your pink parts. <laughs> yeah, yeet. That was the weakest yeah, yeet I've ever given. But, before we go, I shall leave you all with a thought. We promise we will put more thought into things from this point forward, sort of. Maybe not promise. We will try to put more. <laughs> we will endeavor strongly to somewhat at least possibly. Have a, at least have a main topic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I wish. Uh, I like having main topics that are actually topical to what's going on, though, instead of just picking a idea and picking it apart kind of thing. They're both good. I think some of our best ones haven't been topical, though. I just think that recently it's been more flying this year has been more of a flying by the seat of our pants instead of putting a little bit of forethought into things except for like when i sent you that one article i remember that one we actually talked about ahead of time and knocked heads and whatnot but i think it will do better plus there will be nudity so Ooh. audio oh, nudity yeah. i like it audio nudity baby you see it's just the sound of me unbuckling my pants oh Beautiful. All right. Uh, I lost my fact. God damn it. All right. Mm -hmm. Before we should, we should, blah, blah, blah. before we go, I should leave you all thought. Actually, one thing we could do, we can extend. We, I'm going to extend a hand out to the audience here. I want, or I don't want, but it would be really cool if you guys, if you want to see us deliberate more, send us stuff in the mailbag that you'd like us to use as topics. That we can pick. I've asked them for topics before. They just 
they didn't jump on my dick like I wanted them to. And I'm like, <laughs> I love you guys. Like, I thought you'd all just be piled on there like a shish kebab. But like, I would love to get, and we've done it before. I know we've done it with a few questions. Like, it the, lonely. We've done it with a few questions in the past where we've taken the time to actually flesh them out and make them a main topic. So if there's something that you want us to talk about in regards to a main topic, something you heard throughout the week or something that comes to your mind that you think we would that we can that you would like to hear us um, expand upon we would love to hear from you guys not that we're being lazy but we're <laughs> we're giving you guys a way to shift the show in something that you might find more interesting and i also love communication with the community so anything anything that can can push that more i'd love to hear from you guys in that regard but that'll be the last thing before we go i should leave you all with a thought as always the 57 on the Heinz ketchup bottles represents the number of varieties of pickles the company once had. <laughs>